What's up, patriots? You want to know? You want to know why you don't hear about Anthony Wayne anymore? It's because the liberal, communist, blue-haired, tree-humping, eco-cucks have moved on to their next tax grab. Global warming, acid rain, man bear pig, it's all just a big conspiracy to get more of my money. What's next, huh? My AR-15 shot a hole in the ozone layer? Making love to my wife heterosexually is causing methane emissions? And that's why you don't hear about acid rain anymore. Acid rain has joined the ranks of things you thought were gonna be a big problem when you were a kid, alongside quicksand and strangers offering you drugs. Why don't we hear about it anymore? Well, you saw the title. It was economics. Boo, sorry. But was acid rain even really that big of a deal in the first place? Well, the year is 1983, and after buying a house with some spare change you found in the couch, you've decided to head down to the Killarney National Park to take a dip in the lake. But you realize the water is really clear. No, dude, like, it's really clear. Like, there's no algae, no fish, no bugs in this lake. This is one of the many, many lakes in Canada that was rendered completely dead and gnarly. You decide to drive your Camaro, whose paint seems to wear away just a little bit more every time it rains, out of the park when you notice that a lot of the trees have been reduced to black stumps, even though there hasn't been a fire recently. You realize you've popped way too many quaaludes. Around the 70s, scientists started raising the alarm about acid rain killing forests, emptying lakes, causing health problems, eroding monuments and statues. And by the way, if you're one of those Western society is in decline type accounts, this would make a hell of a profile picture. Some acid rain was found to be as acidic as lemon juice. It was bad, okay? What caused this were two chemicals, nitrogen and sulfur, being polluted and mixing with the water in the air to acidify it before it lands. Both nitrogen and sulfur, or their two cute nicknames, Nox and Sox, come from burning fossil fuels, mostly coal and from upstream fossil fuel operations like oil sands. All that to say, the main acid rain causing emitters were big polluting companies, and mainly fossil fuel operations. So obviously, seeing the problems their activities were causing, they all came together and vowed to voluntarily install sulfur scrubbers, reduce their emissions, and switch to cleaner forms of energy. Or maybe, they spent two decades lobbying the US government not to pass any regulations that would cost them even a single cent. Which one do you think it is? Answer now in the comments. No, of course not. Despite pressure from scientists and tree huggers, the Reagan administration rejected 70 bills aimed at regulating emissions that caused acid rain. And this could have been it. Acid rain would just be another easily avoidable horror of the modern 21st century along with climate change and 4chan. But then enter the Canadians. Acid rain was once the single greatest irritant in US-Canadian political relations. Every time a president set foot in good old Canada, he was greeted with protest signs and chants that said, stop acid rain. This is because pollution, well, she doesn't really believe in borders. And short of building a really, really tall wall, the only thing Canadians could do about acid rain destroying their buildings and trees and lakes was protest. Here's Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's take on the acid rain problem. We simply wouldn't let go of it. We got in the Americans' face about it at every bilateral meeting until they realized we were serious about it, that we meant it, and that we wouldn't go away until we had dealt with it to our satisfaction. So bullied on both sides by Canadian protesters and Canadian politicians, those politicians also being bullied by Canadian protesters. In 1990, the US under H.W. Bush finally amended the Clean Air Act to put a limit on NOx and SOx. And in 1991, the US and Canada signed a bilateral agreement to continuously reduce pollution. Wow, there was a time the Conservatives cared about the environment. The big polluting industries were, of course, furious, saying it would drive up energy prices, the science isn't settled, what about jobs, regulations or communism, and so on. Eerily familiar, no? But the regulations were passed, and they were passed capitalism style. Not just cap, but also trade. This is the maximum amount of pollution you're allowed to pollute. This is a cap. Sounds obvious. Companies are given emissions allowances and are not able to go over them. But here's the fun part. They get to trade them. Hence the name, cap and trade. 
Some companies were able to reduce their emissions easily by installing smokestack scrubbers or switching to cleaner energy. And other companies were like, I stop polluting, my wife's not gonna look me in the eye anymore. So those companies could buy the right to pollute from the companies that cleaned their act up. And if you're lucky, a conversation like this happened. Why well, say, fellow businessman, it sure is a lovely day to be a rich white man in the 90s. Why, yes it is, sir, and thank you so much for saying so. I got your allowances right here, boss. It cost us a bundle, but now we can pollute forever. Jenkins, you idiot! I just spent weeks installing smokestack scrubbers and reducing our company's reliance on coal so we wouldn't have to blow all our simoleons on these stupid allowances. Well, boss, we could always sell them. Jenkins, you madman, you're a genius. We can install even more scrubbers, switch to even more clean electricity, and then sell our allowances over to those suckers at the coal plant who can't get with the times. Then we'll take all that money and invest it in Beanie Babies. We're gonna be rich! And while we shouldn't ignore the fact that acid rain is still a big problem in countries that have more recently industrialized, like China and India, this is considered a solved problem in the US, Canada, and Europe. And what about those industries complaining that it would destroy the economy, drive them out of business, and skyrocket the price of energy? The Business Roundtable predicted that the new rules would cost $104 billion a year, so something like a 50% increase in electricity prices. In reality, the real price of electricity fell steadily as the acid rain program went into effect. And the costs of complying with the new measures were cheaper than even the people pushing for the policy projected them to the cost. So cheaper energy, not much huge expense to businesses, and an entire environmental crisis now so irrelevant that people are calling it a hoax. Well, I mean, I guess they're calling climate change a hoax too. Whatever. These caps were reduced every year, down to levels that would no longer cause toxic acid rain, lives were saved, and we did it! Okay, that's it! Like, comment, and subscribe! Except, rain doesn't just acidify due to sulfur and nitrogen emissions, but also from carbon emissions. And you don't hear so much about this, because carbon emissions also just happen to be the thing causing the overheating of the planet and the destruction of the biosphere that makes organized human life possible. So like, bigger fish to fry, I guess. But at least those fish are alive. So anyway, that takes us to first acid rain, now climate change. It's an emissions cap. Get it? Guys, we gotta do something about these carbon emissions. Having learned our lesson here in Canada about the effectiveness of a cap and trade system of reducing emissions, surely that's what we'd go for to reduce carbon, right? No. Instead, we went with a wildly unpopular carbon tax, and even though the tax revenue is returned to people's bank accounts, it's still causing riots in the damn streets. Look at these hockey stick protest signs. Ain't they cute? Carbon emissions are different from sulfur and nitrogen. Those are mainly emitted by a few big polluters, and they largely come from coal. But carbon kind of comes from everywhere, including my own mouth when I'm yapping. So can carbon work in a cap-and-trade system? Let's find out. California and Europe have cap-and-trade systems for carbon, and like the acid rain one, it's going down over time. So how's that going for them? Well, it's nuanced! Both of those systems are criticized as being as toothless as my cat. Wait, good girl. Toothless as my cat. Good girl. Look at that, you got no teeth as toothless as my cat. Making pollution so cheap that in Europe, electric utilities have found it cheaper to run their coal-fired power plants than to switch to less polluting natural gas. An analysis of California's oil and gas industry shows that they actually increased their emissions by 3.5% six years after cap and trade began. The state has overall decreased their emissions and actually surpassed their 2020 emissions reductions target but experts are saying that doesn't really have much to do with the cap and trade, actually. Judging by the fact that a recent auction actually left some carbon credits unsold like nobody wanted them, there's a good chance that that success can be chalked up to other stronger regulations than cap and trade. The problem with market-based systems like cap and trade is that lobbyists can get their grubby little hands, their grubby little hands, into the nitty gritty and tweak it however they like. And, you know, cheating is even pretty cheap. Even if carbon is priced appropriately, the fines for exceeding permitted levels are sometimes ineffectively low. In the EU, a fine can be as low as 100 euros per excess tonne. 
Considering that's not much more than the price of a permit, it's hardly a deterrent. And that's if firms even get caught. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! So this is a win-win for big polluting companies. They get to keep admitting the public stop criticizing them so much because, hey, there's a cap-and-trade system now. For reference, honey, do you want down? Say hey, bye. Bye, Blue. So much cat hair. For reference, experts estimate that the price of a ton of carbon should be around $100 to account for all of the damage that it does. In California, it's $17. The EU is trying to shore up its cap and trade system, making the prices of carbon higher, making the supply lower, including a border tax so you can't just cheat it by importing cheap goods from places without regulations. Cap and trade systems can succeed by saying, look, this is gonna be the most that your industry can emit. Now you have to figure out how to get underneath it. It's not gonna be cheap, no cheating. I really did start this video wanting to recommend cap and trade as a really good way to fix climate change. And it kinda is if the caps are strict enough and the effects are targeted enough and we keep big oil lobbyist bullshit out of it. From really nerding out about carbon markets for admittedly way too long, that's why I'm doing YouTube now because I cannot fit all this into 90 seconds. I'm of the personal opinion that it's kind of like the plain white rice in your stir fry. Not that nutritious, but it makes a really good base for your more spicy policies like renewable energy mandates and emission standards. It's important to think about the cap and trade story not as a magic bullet that can solve every problem, but as proof that environmental activism, strong policies that are stronger than the lobbyists fighting against it, international collaboration really can make insurmountable problems like acid rain or hell, climate change. Um, surmountable? Is that a word? Oh, hey, if you're still here, throw me a like. And if you're here from Instagram and TikTok, my videos were way too short. I wanted to get into the weeds, so I'll be doing more here. Love you. Nebula hit me up. And that's why you don't hear about acid rain anymore. <laughs> <laughs> to my wife, heterosexually. <laughs> 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 that's good. That's good. <laughs>